the flight deck of an aircraft carrier is considered a hazardous work environment. This is due to the presence of aircraft's landing and taking off in close proximity, as well as potential hazards from rockets, fuel, and arresting wires. Being on the flight deck of an aircraft carrier is considered the most dangerous job in the U.S. Navy. Over a 15-year period, 918 deck personnel were injured, with 43 fatalities, 47 disabilities, and the rest sustaining major injuries. Over 90% of all accidents are due human error. Modern aircraft carriers are safer and more efficient, with the ability to launch two aircrafts and recover one every 37 seconds in daylight. Injury rates have decreased to as low as 30 incidents per 100,000 recoveries in recent years. However, this has not always been the case. Now, we will be exploring the evolution of aircraft carriers with a focus on key design changes. The most impactful change in the latest fourth-class carriers may not be what you expect. On November 14, 1910, the U.S. Navy successfully launched an airplane from the light cruiser, USS Birmingham. Two months later, the first arrested landing took place on board. The launch and arrested landing on USS Birmingham marked the start of American naval aviation, but a major shift occurred 12 years later with the conversion of the Collier USS Jupiter into the aircraft carrier, USS Langley. With its 542-foot flight deck, retractable mass and exhaust pipes, and flush deck design, the USS Langley was a game-changer. The USS Langley was an experimental ship not bound by naval treaties, aimed at determining the basic doctrine for operating an aircraft carrier. The first landings and takeoffs took place during this time. The U.S. Navy gained invaluable experience on the flight deck of USS Langley as they experimented and improved arresting wires and catapults. Despite numerous plane crashes, pilot injuries, and fatalities, they eventually figured it out, although at a great cost. Early arresting systems were weight-based, with the initial system using sandbags. bags. The wires were suspended 10 inches above the deck, but this method resulted in the instrument phase. The instrument phase was a hallmark of Langley pilots who spent five years figuring out basic carrier operations. This often resulted in pilots smashing their faces against the instrument panel during unsuccessful landings, causing tooth loss and broken noses. The weight-based system was used until the 1930s, when it was replaced by hydraulic cylinder arresting gear, enabling landing of heavier aircraft at higher speeds. USS Lexington and USS Saratoga were the first two American carriers with islands, which redirected exhaust plumes away from the flight deck. The downsides of the island superstructure included increased air turbulence and decreased flight deck clearance, but the benefits still outweigh the risks. The islands were installed on the starboard side of both carriers. The island was installed on the starboard side to accommodate for propeller plane torque during takeoff and landing. Propellers spinning clockwise caused planes to swing to the port side, so the island on the starboard side helped pilots correct for this. Another advantage was easier navigation and smaller channels. The Lexington-class carriers were initially built as battle cruisers, but were modified to aircraft carriers during construction. They were very successful, proving the value of large carriers to the U.S. Navy. The Lexington-class carriers were 900 feet long, had a top speed of 35 knots, and could carry 90 aircrafts. They had two elevators, a divided hangar with a fire curtain, and were the largest carriers in the U.S. Navy until 1945. They often participated in war game exercises between World War I and World War II. During peacetime between World War I and World War II, the U.S. Navy developed strategies on utilizing aircraft carriers through war games. In Fleet Problem 10, USS Saratoga separated from the fleet to attack the Panama Canal, testing its shore and naval defenses against a battleship attack. The attack on the Panama Canal was the start of the Carrier Center Task Force, as proposed a year later by Lieutenant Commander Forrest Sherman. The attack was a success and took the defenders by surprise, launching planes 200 miles at sea at dawn and hitting the canal with a DV bombing attack. This demonstrated the effectiveness of aircraft carriers in the early days. Barrier wires were installed to protect crew and park planes in case a landing aircraft missed the arresting wire. A missed wire often meant the plane couldn't take off again, but hitting the barrier wires caused damage and injury to the pilot, which was still better than the alternatives.
Ranger was redesigned to have an island superstructure and was the first American carrier built specifically as such. In the early days, barrier wires were installed to prevent crashed aircraft from reaching park planes and crew. The wires were lowered for taxiing and helped reduce damage and injury to the pilot. The U.S. Navy added an island superstructure to the USS Ranger, which was initially designed with a flush stick design like the USS Langley. However, due to the Washington Naval Treaty, the island was added during construction. Despite this, the USS Ranger was deemed obsolete as the minimum effective size of a carrier was realized to be 20,000 tons, while Ranger only had a displacement of 14,000 tons. The USS Ranger was built from the ground up as an aircraft carrier, but budget cuts due to the Great Depression resulted in removal of several design features, including extra elevators. Despite this, it was the first carrier to have weapon elevators. Despite its designation, Ranger was considered too slow for operations in the Pacific and was deemed a failure as an aircraft carrier. It missed most of World War II and was deployed in the Atlantic before being sold for scrap. The Yorktown class and Wasp class, including USS Enterprise, were the last carriers limited by the Washington Treaty. They featured three elevators, one more than the two on the Lexington class, which were found inadequate. The deckage elevators were first introduced on the sole ship of the Wasp class, USS Wasp, as an experiment and later incorporated into the Essex class carriers. The Essex class carriers had an increased deck space and additional parking when the elevator was in the up position. They were the most numerous capital ships built in the 20th century, with 24 built out of 32 ordered during World War II. They were not limited by treaties and were larger than previous classes. They had a larger flight deck and hangar, plus innovations such as torpedo protection, hangar deck armor, and the bulbous bow. Early flight decks were made of wood and unarmored. The flight decks of early carriers that were made of wood made them lighter and easier to repair, but created a vulnerability to bomb penetration to lower decks. Pre-World War II carriers like the Yorktown and Wasp class had limited to no armor. This design flaw was acknowledged but couldn't be addressed. The lack of armor proved fatal for USS Wasp, the USS Yorktown, and the USS Hornet when they were lost in 1942 and 43 due to torpedo attacks. The absence of armor on the Yorktown and Wasp class carriers proved fatal, with all three ships being lost in battle during World War II. In contrast, none of the heavily armored Essex class carriers were lost despite being subjected to bombing, suicide planes, and fires. The Essex class featured a 2.5-inch hangar deck armor, the USS Franklin and USS Bunker Hill, both survived significant damage during World War II, with the Franklin badly damaged by a Japanese air attack, and the Bunker Hill hit by two kamikazes in quick succession, yet both returned home under their own power. The lessons learned from World War II led to the addition of armor to flight decks. The Midway class of carriers was given a three and a half inch armor plating at the deck level and two inch plating at the hangar level. Midway was the first US carrier class to have armor protection for hangars. However, adding armor caused increased weight and decreased seaworthiness as the flight deck would be flooded during rough seas. The Midway class carriers could carry up to 137 aircrafts. The Midway class was the last aircraft carrier limited by the Panama Canal locks and could carry up to 137 aircraft, but was limited to operating only 120. The next carrier class was set to be a supercarrier. After World War II, it became clear that the future of naval aviation would be dominated by jet-powered aircrafts. Carriers had to be modified for heavier, faster jet aircrafts. This included adding a jet engine test facility or completely redesigning the flight deck, such as the angled deck which was tested by the British in 1952 and by the Americans on USS Antietam, an Essex-class carrier with a 10.5-degree angle to the left of the axis. Higher speeds of jet aircrafts necessitated an angled flight deck for simultaneous launch and recovery operations, as a straight flight deck would have blocked takeoffs during landings, leading to inefficiencies. Jet aircrafts presented an operational issue to carriers in the case of emergency landings. If a tailhook or landing gear broke, barrier wires may not be enough to stop the aircraft. To address this, barricades were invented, 
Jet aircraft posed an operational challenge in the event of emergency landings. If a tailhook or landing gear failed, barrier wires were insufficient, so barricades were developed to solve this issue. A barricade is a quick to install emergency recovery system that uses webbing with upper and lower horizontal straps to transfer the energy of a landing aircraft to arresting engines. Barricade engagements, although rare, have saved lives. The fourth Ford class of four ships were the first supercarriers, larger than the Midway class, with 100 feet longer and 20 feet wider. The deeper hull of the Ford class provided improved seakeeping compared to the previous class, while still featuring an armored flight deck. The ships, Forstall and Saratoga, were initially built as axial deck carriers but converted to angled deck during construction. An angled deck allowed for a larger island, spacious hangars, and improved damage control. The Ford class had four catapults and four elevators compared to three on the Midway class. As the first supercarrier, Forstall's design was not yet refined. Mistakes were made in the design of Forstall, such as the problematic placement of the portside elevator at the aft of an angled deck next to the catapults, which severely limited flight operations when the elevator was down. These issues were fixed in the later Kitty Hawk class carriers, with the elevator moved to the aft end of the angled deck. The Kitty Hawk class carriers were essentially improved for stalls with a 40 feet longer angled deck, larger fuel tanks, relocated elevators, and installed Terrier missile launchers. Three were built in total. The fourth Kitty Hawk class carrier, USS John F. Kennedy, is considered a subclass with minor design changes. JFK was meant to be nuclear powered, but budget cuts resulted in her being conventionally powered. She was the last conventionally powered carrier built for the US Navy. Prior to World War II, catapults were seldom used, with an estimated 40% of aircraft launches relying on them by the end of the war. With the rise of supercarriers and jet aircrafts in the early 1950s, catapults became essential. Commander C.C. Mitchell of the Royal Navy developed his team-based system that was effective and efficient in launching jets. The U.S. Navy was impressed with the British steam-based catapult system and bought five for testing. The trials were successful, especially because of the consistent acceleration throughout most of its stroke. As a result, the U.S. Navy adopted steam catapults on all its carriers after the end of the testing project. The forward catapults had two extensions called the bridle catcher. The bridle linked the shuttle to the aircraft, pulling it down the catapult track with increasing speed. At the end, the aircraft would launch into the air and the bridle would be thrown into the sea, unless the carrier had a bridle catcher. Modern carriers no longer use bridle catchers. The launch bar is directly attached to the aircraft's nose gear, making bridles obsolete. Early naval aviators relied on their sight and LSOs for landing guidance. LSOs relied on flags, cloth paddles, and lighted wands to guide pilots.